killed Smitty, cousin. Nice landing. <laughs> Smitty, man! Always in the way! <laughs> Welcome to the Mad Max Minute Presents Waterworld H2O Minutes at a Time. I'm Rick. And I'm Julia. And today we're talking about Minutes 141 and 142. They begin with two smoker mechanics taking a workplace accident in stride and end with Deacon pontificating about dry land. I want to launch right into the book. Because at the top of today's clip, we've got Jang and Truen. They are confronting the Mariner who has just killed one of their co-workers, and I feel like it is so much more fun in the book. So that's where we're going to start. Okay. The Mariner, his jet ski brought to a convenient and sudden stop by a now-deceased smoker, found himself in the ship's jet ski launching chamber, with two surprised-looking smokers approaching him, splashing through the shallow water covering the floor. He just sat there quietly, waiting for them to make a move, his hand hovering over the scabbard that held the late Chester's shotgun. You killed Smitty, one of the smokers said, but the other one was laughing. Nice landing, dumb shit, the second smoker <laughs> called out to the mariner. The other one was shaking his head. That's Smitty, man, always getting in the way. Yeah, the second one said. Looks like he perished in a terrible accident. Yeah, the first one said. What a lame brain. And arms slung around each other's shoulders, the two smokers exited the chamber into the ship, their laughter echoing off steel walls. So I like it in the book better because listeners may recall back in episode 70, Smitty was giving them a hard time about trying to rush repairs on the jet skis, that they are going to fall victim to a terrible accident and they are lame brains and they got to turn it right back around on him. Right, because he's dead. <laughs> In the movie, it's phrased a little differently. You've got Jang with his cigar, who's very serious at first. You killed Smitty, cousin. And the Mariner, as we discussed last time, starting to rev up those fight or flight responses. And then Truon cracks this huge smile and seems to congratulate the Mariner sarcastically, saying, nice landing, which prompts Jeng to crack up, and I can't help but like these two. Yeah, I'm really okay with them. Their attitude feels relatable in a bizarre way. Mm -hmm. There's this attitude in our society of not liking our bosses, and you know, most of us don't take it to this extreme that they do, being <laughs> gleeful at their death. But in this world, death just means different things. Yeah. Death is around every corner, so you just got to roll with it. Right. As these two pass the Mariner, Truon gets right down in Smitty's dead face and says, Smitty, I quit. And Jeng declares to everyone within earshot that he is now in charge. He is taking over Smitty's position. I think it's important to note that in the book, they are just two smokers waiting for their jet skis to be done. In the movie, they seem to be other mechanics. In fact, their labels are Smoker Mechanic 1 and Smoker Mechanic 2. Right. Smitty was their boss and apparently was a bit of a workhorse. <laughs> they don't seem to appreciate his managerial style. Mm -hmm. I like to think that if the Ds were to survive past the next few minutes that Jang would have an unpleasant surprise about what it's actually like to run a department. He would probably fall into a lot of those practices that he did not appreciate seeing in Smitty. Right. He's probably like, oh, now I get it. Mm-hmm. Okay. <laughs> like, if Smitty was always getting on his case about cleaning up his work area or making sure that things were properly stowed and drained and or something to that effect, he would get into this position of management over these other mechanics and then realize, oh, wait, if they don't do these things, that means I have to do them. And I already have enough work as is. The light would come on and then he would appreciate all too late all the things that Smitty used to do. 
Right. And maybe he wouldn't want that job anymore. Maybe he wished Smitty was still around to do it. Mm -hmm. Although, from the way that they say Smitty Man, always in the way, I imagine that he was a bit of a hoverer. Yeah, it does indicate a style where if his employees were just left to their own devices, they would be fine. Mm -hmm. He was always there, always hovering, always getting in the way. Pointing out, oh, maybe you should do that this way. Oh, that goes Mm -hmm. over here. And it's like, no, Smitty, I know what to do. You don't need to point it out to me every five seconds. Yeah. Which is probably where most of their ire came from, if I had to venture a guess, considering this is a side character in a (laughs) cutscene. So these two go off into the depths of the ship to do who knows what, and the Mariner decides, okay, I need to get moving. I need to make my way up to the deck or wherever the Deacon is now. He's on a hunt to find Enola, and as he passes through these corridors, he is suddenly surprised to hear the Deacon's voice and stumbles backwards into a mattress before he realizes that he's listening not to the man himself, but a PA speaker on the wall. Something that you're likely never to find outside of a place like the D's where all of this stuff is pre-existing. Yeah, I like that he's genuinely confused. We have been learning about the Mariner and seeing how completely capable he is. But even the most capable among us, you throw us in an unfamiliar environment. And especially if you throw at us a technology that we have never seen before, we are going to be disoriented. We're going to be confused. So that felt like a human moment right? for the Mariner. It reminds me of a scene from a television show in one of the later seasons of Community. Chevy Chase has effectively left the show and the main character, Jeff, is walking out of a building and suddenly... Chevy Chase's character pops up in a hologram in front of him. And it is one of those Star Trek type holograms where it's lit from the floor and it's all blue and translucent. I say Star Trek. It kind of looks like a Star Wars ghost. But anyway, (laughs) there's a scene where he listens to him basically list the virtues of the school. And it's fun to see someone like the character Jeff, who is a modern individual who knows all about video calls and cell phones and stuff, and he's still surprised by a technology that is outside of the norm. Mm, yes. Just like the Mariner is surprised by a loudspeaker. The situation is described in the book this way. The Mariner stepped cautiously through the roughly sought-out doorway that led into the bowels of the ship. Suddenly, a voice boomed above his head, making the Mariner whirl, knife whipped from its sheath. Here he is, the voice resounded, and it was coming from a small cloth faced box fastened at head level from the steel wall. What kind of box was this that could speak? And it continued on. Rise up, brothers and sisters, turn your eyes and open your hearts to your humble benefactor, your spiritual shepherd and dictator for life, the deacon of the D's. Was this box somehow relaying a voice from elsewhere in the ship? Whatever it was, whatever it was coming from, this was nothing he wanted to hear. He slapped the box as if it were an offending face and smashed (laughs) it right off the wall. It clattered onto the floor in pieces. He sheathed his knife and pressed on, moving deeper into the recesses of the ship, hoping his smoker goggles and jacket would pave the way. I appreciate the verbalization of what we see happen. That's nice. I like it. Uh, Production-wise, I do want to point out that the speaker that the Mariner knocks off the wall isn't actually connected to anything. (laughs) There's like a bit of sparks and it just falls and disappears. There's no connector left behind. There's no wires left behind that he cut. It wasn't actually connected to the wall. It was probably just glued or taped to the wall (laughs) in such a way that he could knock it down. Right. Yeah. As we cut away from the Mariner in the depths of the ship, we go back up to the Deacon's stateroom, and this is where the theatrical cut rejoins us. Everything we've been talking about up to this point has all been Ulysses cut stuff. Oh, okay. Anyway, the Nord is doing a thing that I'm sure that plenty of teenagers have done in the past. He has poured himself a drink from a bottle of alcohol, then noticed how much the levels have changed and is replacing the spent alcohol with water. I've never done it, but then again, my parents never kept alcohol in the house, so I would have never had the opportunity to. But Enola clearly sees that this is something that the Nord should not be doing, 
and rebukes him for it, saying, you shouldn't be doing that. You're going to get in trouble. I am kind of confused by this whole thing. He's the Nord. He's the second in command. If he wants to finish a bottle, can't he finish a bottle? Right. Like Of anybody on that ship, shouldn't he be allowed to take whatever booze he wants? The bottle doesn't seem particularly special. Yeah, and I suppose that there is an allowance of liquor allowed, and perhaps he has exceeded that allowance. I mean, he has been drinking in almost every scene that we've seen him in. It would not surprise me if he had a sort of ticket allowance, like, hey, it's the first of the month, here are your booze tickets, save them up or use them however you want, and he blows through all of them far too quickly. Right, so now somebody else left their bottle sitting there. And so he is stealing from it, even though the other people who would punish him for drinking their booze, namely the doctor and the deacon, both have bottles in their hands Mm -hmm. out on the balcony. I just don't really understand what's happening here. It really does appear to be his own bottle. And who cares how fast he's drinking it? Who cares if he's watering it down? Like, who cares? Anola cares because she's a know-it-all. This is one of these moments that makes me not like her. This whole scene makes me not like her because she's such a brat. She's so like, nah, 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 nah. oh, shut up. The Nord seems to have been ignoring her because he turns around and says, oh, that's right. You're not afraid. You've got your pet freak coming to rescue you, which prompts Enola to once again repeat that the Mariner is not a freak and that not only is that the case, that she believes that the Mariner would be able to take the Nord in a fight any time, owing to the fact that he has killed dozens of people and doesn't have any mercy or anything, and he even kills little girls. She's making this up on purpose, right? Or does she think these things of the Mariner? So this is bouncing back to that conversation they had before he right. threw her in the ocean. Right. He said these exact things to her. How many people have you killed? And he didn't give her a distinct number. All he said was including little girls. Like, he was teasing her about it. Yeah. She's taking that and turning it into, oh, yes, he has killed dozens of people, including little girls, because that's what he told her. Face value. Okay. I mean, he's killed five smokers in the past several episodes. Right. His kill streak is rising quickly now. His kill-to-death ratio is continuing to rise. And he is not done. Nope. Not by a long shot. He's just getting warmed up. And the Nord does this thing as he's listening to Enola prattle on. He crosses the room and he slams his hands into the back of the chair on either side of Enola's head and he gets right up in her face. And we see from Enola's perspective that he is super close and he gives us this evil grin and he says, haven't we all? I like this interaction because he's essentially telling Enola, I am more than a match for your Mariner. Our battle will be epic if it comes to blows. I also took that as a threat to her. He is willing to kill little girls. Oh, yeah, of course. It's just a sad reminder that we are not going to get an epic battle between the Nord and the Mariner. And it's a bit of a bummer. And I've been bummed about it ever (laughs) since... They had their first interaction back on the atoll. First of all, I don't remember what happens. It's been so long since I've seen this movie in the entirety. I don't really remember how things go. So I'm really going episode by episode here. But also, we have two antagonists set up. One being the Nord, who has actual personal interactions with the Mariner, who is our protagonist, sort of. And they have a reason to fight each other. But the Nord's not the big bad. So the big good is supposed to fight the big bad, which is the deacon. So it's kind of like, okay, well, which one is the Mariner supposed to have his boss battle with? Emotionally, it feels like the Nord, but story-wise, it needs to be the deacon. If this movie took more notes from Robocop than it did the Italian Mad Max ripoffs, they would have cast the Nord in the same position as Clarence Boddicker. So Clarence Boddicker, he's played by the dad from that 70s show. He Mm. is the crime boss of old Detroit is the best way to describe him. And so in the context of Robocop being a cop and fighting drug dealers, Clarence is this big bad character. But it's revealed over the course of the movie that Clarence 
works at the behest of Dick Jones, played by Ronnie Cox, who is an executive with Omni Consumer Products. And so at the end of the day, Dick Jones is the big bad that RoboCop has to take care of. But at the same time, you've still got Clarence Boddicker, which RoboCop has to deal with. And so RoboCop and Clarence get to have their big showdown with Clarence's gang in the steel mill. And it's a really cool scene. RoboCop taking down Dick Jones also happens, but it happens in the falling climax because he's just tying up loose ends. And so ideally, the big battle would be between the Mariner and the Nord as these two heavy characters. And then the Mariner would dispatch the Deacon as a way to get through him to the final destination. Yeah, I like that idea a lot. You can still have the Mariner stop the plane from taking off, start getting away with Enola, and then the Deacon comes back and climbs up onto the rope behind them. You can still do all of that, but mm, I'll talk about it more when it happens. I don't want to take now what I could talk about later. Instead... I'm going to dive into the book. The mean blonde one, the Nord, was rustling around in a cabinet that had a lot of bottles in it. He grinned and lifted one of them, labeled gin, and stole several gulps. Then he frowned, looking at the lowered liquid level in the clear bottle, and filled it back up from a hydro jug. Shouldn't be doing that, she told him, needling him just a little. He whirled, long blonde hair swinging. It was as if he'd forgotten she was there. Maybe he didn't expect her to have any spark left in her. You'll get in trouble, she chided. Oh, I forgot, he said. You're not afraid. Your pet freak is coming to rescue you. That's right, she said, scooching up straighter. She was still on the ugly, shaggy orange floor covering next to the plastic-covered chair. Only he's not a freak, and he could beat you up any time. He smiled, mildly amused. Beat me up? Any time, she affirmed. Is that a fact? The voice of the deacon had been coming from a small box mounted on the wall but for the last few minutes nothing had come out of the box but cheering. This seemed to make the Nord nervous. He was pacing. She needled him some more. He's killed dozens of people, you know, she said. Oh, is that right? Now the provider told me this personally, the deacon's voice said. And he doesn't show mercy or anything. On anybody, she said. He even kills little girls. We need to go there, the deacon was saying, and settle it. Build on it. Kills little girls, does he, the Nord said, and smiled big at her. Well, I'm glad to hear we have something in common. Enola swallowed. Maybe needling him wasn't such a good idea. I like the interaction in the book. I feel like I say this a lot that I like the book better. I like that his threat is a little bit more sarcastic. It's a little more joking because the scene as a whole, especially the way that you read it, felt like he was mocking her the whole time. And I just don't really get that same sense from how it was performed in the movie. But I like the mocking tone. She's just a kid. He doesn't care what she says. Mm -hmm. He's poking fun at her. We leave them behind to rejoin the smokers down by the opening to the jet ski garage. We find Jang. He is on a jet ski and he pulls a smoker from the water and he says, dang. And he looks up to the others and he says, it's horse. Truon is there and he's surrounded by other smokers. There are five of them, four men and one woman. And the woman is in the center and I point her out. Because when the word is shouted up that horse is dead, her eyes go wide. And her eyes go so wide that it makes her pop in the middle of the frame. And it makes me chuckle a little bit. Especially because she's so surprised. But then you've got Truon who starts shouting, find him, find him. And all the five smokers snap out of this surprise and they run off as a group to start looking for this guy. I want to talk about the positioning of things real quick. Okay. The smoker on the jet ski finds horse, and then the camera pans up and to the left a little bit, and we discover we're right next to that hole. Mm -hmm. Where the mariner just happened upon the side of the boat, where he climbed the boat, where he jumped back down to kill the two and to drown them and steal the jet ski was literally right next to the hole. Apparently. And I find that amusing. Yep. (laughs) All they had to do was have someone lean out that hole and they probably would have seen everything. Yeah. (laughs) It's also amusing that earlier at the top of this clip, when we've got Truen and Jang, who witness Smitty being killed by the Mariner, a man they did not recognize, 
they were totally cool with it. Mm-hmm. But now that the situation is playing out a little bit more, all of a sudden they're not okay with it anymore. Yeah. The book reveals a bit more explanation as to why they don't raise an alarm in this situation. Because you would imagine dead smokers outside, dead smokers inside, someone they didn't quite recognize maybe raised an alarm, right? Right, you'd think so. Chiron and Jang, the smokers who had witnessed Smitty's terrible accident, returned to the launching chamber shortly thereafter with a replacement smoker who could take the deceased Smitty's place as master of the launching area. But something just outside the entrance, close enough that the fog couldn't conceal it, had caught their eyes. Standing in the very spot where Smitty had stood and unwittingly waited to be killed, Truon looked out at an empty, bobbing patrol boat and two floating smoker corpses. We've got an intruder, Jang said. Shit, Truon said, and he was right in front of us. Don't tell the deacon, Jang said. What, and get killed? Above them came the roar of the smoker crowd cheering the deacon's entrance. Truon considered the consequences for all of them if the deacon's big night was spoiled by sabotage. And what if this had been the work of that fish man? The Dees was rife with rumors of the child captive's murmurings of the demon who would come to save her. Spread the word, Truon said. Find him. Bag and tag, Jing asked. Bag and tag, Truon affirmed. I really like their camaraderie. It's appealing in its darkness. Yeah. <laughs> so, they had been warned, maybe not officially, but by rumor, that a Muto would be coming to attack. Mm-hmm. And yet, a stranger comes in from the fog, and they're cool with it. I like how they're able to admit to themselves that their initial action was not entirely appropriate. And also how they determine that since they made this mistake, that they should be the ones to try and clean it up before it becomes an even bigger mistake. And they just so happen to rope in a small troop of smokers that are standing nearby to help them do it. To bag and tag. I suppose that is commendable in a sort of way. It would have been easy to walk away and pretend that you had never seen anything (laughs) and free yourself of responsibility for whatever is to come because they're right if it's discovered that they witnessed him coming aboard and could have done something to stop him or at least alerted yeah the crew as a whole and they didn't do anything yeah they're gonna die the deacon will not appreciate that no (laughs) remember though Then it's all a moot point. None of it matters. We cut back to the deacon on his platform. He is shouting along with his smokers. They are whipped into a frenzy. Cutting inside real quick, we see that the Nord is getting anxious. Enola interprets that as him getting nervous, but the Nord insists that he does not get nervous, blowing smoke in her face. What is the Nord anxious about? He knows that this is a big pageantry moment. He knows that he's waiting for a cue, and then he's got to carry a knoll outside. He's got a little bit of stage fright butterflies. Not that he's necessarily frightened of going out there in front of everybody, but he just knows that there's a cue that he's got to hit. And if the deacon gets to a point in his speech, and he's like, here she is, the girl that's going to lead us to dryland, and the Nord doesn't appear because he's doing something he's not supposed to do, then that is going to reflect poorly on him. And so he's standing there saying, okay, where's my cue? Where's my cue? Waiting for that cue. Okay. Did I miss a moment of setup where I should have known this prior to this moment? Would a first time viewer know why the Nord is nervous? Yeah, maybe. Maybe not. Okay. It's sort of a... Like, did I miss something? Because I had no idea that that was going to happen. It might just be that I'm drawing that conclusion because of the context. Okay. It makes sense to me that that's why he's nervous. Because I see no other reason why he would be. Yeah, it makes sense to me too. I'm on board. I'm just wondering if I missed something that was supposed to know that the Nord is waiting for a cue and just doesn't want to miss it. I don't think he's nervous about going out in front of the people. I don't even think he's nervous about necessarily disappointing the deacon. I think he's just... Like you said, I'm waiting for a cue. Where's my cue? Gotta get my cue. Gotta pay attention. Gotta get my cue. And so the deacon is continuing his sermon there. He says, and if there's a river, we'll damn it. And if there's a tree, we'll ram it. 
And I appreciate him trying to stick with a weird little rhyming scheme, but I know for sure that if they get to dry land and they try to start ramming trees, it's going to go poorly for them. Yeah. You almost want to see them find dry land just so they can stumble around (laughs) not knowing what to do with it. Right. It would turn into a real life example of someone playing Minecraft trying to punch a tree to get wood. Yeah, but that works. In In Minecraft, Minecraft. it works. In real life, it doesn't. Yeah, like when you first start Minecraft, that's exactly the first thing you have to do. The very first action you take is to start punching trees. Yeah, but can you imagine just a bunch of smokers, they get on dry land and they just start going to punch trees? (laughs) It's absurd. As the deacon continues, he says, because I'm talking progress here. Yes, sir. I'm talking development, which smokers in the crowd love to hear. And then he says... We shall suck and savor the sweet flavor of dry land. And it makes me wonder, if you walk into, let's say, a gas station, drugstore situation, and you walk up to the soda fountain or the ice cream cabinet, and you see the label that says dry land, what do you think the savory flavor of dry land would be? Oh, I would think of wine. (laughs) That's what I think of, wine. That does seem to be the savory flavor that would come from the the Yeah. I was going to make some sort of half-hearted joke about dirt water. Oh, (laughs) well, what is wine but dirt water? It reminds me- Fermented dirt water. It reminds me of flavors like Rocky Road. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Moose tracks. That sounds like a good option. Mm, So earthy. Yeah, exactly. The idea of saying, oh, yeah, we're going to suck and savor the sweet flavor. And it's like, okay, that's one way to put it. It just seems a little over the top. His language is so bizarre. Yeah. He seems more interested in creating rhyme and rhythm than actually saying anything. I think the rhythm is especially true. Yeah, because the people are so excited about this. They don't know what any of this means. They don't know what development is. They don't get to watch his videos of golf tournaments. They don't know what dry land looks like. Do they even know what rivers and trees are? (laughs) There may be rumors of what rivers and trees are, just like there's rumors of Enola being captive. These are talky sort of people. But do they have the context that they need to understand what he's saying? At the end of the day, all they got to do is trust in the Deegan. Right. And the way he's talking now, they are closer than ever to finding what they've been looking for. Right. His language does put me in mind of the Bible, where often, as it's recorded, God and his prophets, they speak to people, and often the people don't have the context to understand what's being told to them. And then we have that same problem. Like, we don't have the context needed to know what they were talking about way back then. So everything's open to interpretation, which has led to our world of wildly varied interpretations of the Bible, which has led to wars and death and hatred and all sorts of horrible, horrible things. Mm -hmm. Cutting inside, Enola is continuing to pester the Nord, this time calling attention to his face being all red. We don't get to hear his reaction because that is going to come next time around. But suffice it to say, she has realized that annoying him is a strategy that can get a rise out of him and throw him off balance even just a little bit. So she's going to keep doing it. Absolutely. So come back next time. We will hear Enola continue to taunt the Nord as she weaves the legend of the Mariner. Deacon will reach the climax of his speech and Nord will grab Enola to bring her outside. The Mad Max Minute podcast is a fan project by Rick and Julia Ingham. Waterworld was written by Peter Rader and David Tui, directed by Kevin Reynolds, and presented by Universal Pictures. Mad Max Minute is produced and edited by Rick Ingham. Our opening music is Verdi's Dies Irae by Daniel Batista of danielbatista.com. Our home on the internet is madmaxminute.com. You can follow us on Twitter at Mad Max Minute. And like us on Facebook by searching Mad Max Minute and join our Facebook listener group, Mad Max Minute Beyond Microphone. If you'd like to support the podcast, visit patreon.com slash madmaxmin. Thank you for joining us for Waterworld episode 71. We'll see you next time.